uh, it's always great to be here in the Unbox, and I would like actually to start by thanking Abdullah and his team for giving us such a great place for the real estate industry to come and meet and talk and brainstorm. And actually a few weeks ago, actually two weeks ago, we had a gathering here in the same place for the Owners Association Managers Company, where we brought them here and we said, guys, look, we are together in this journey. We want to make this real estate market more competitive. Think more, how can we make this more competitive in your owners, in owners association industry? So we had actually great ideas coming from this place. And today I was sitting with Rira CEO and he was like, Mahmoud, all the ideas that came from that brainstorming session, we need to act on, we need to implement. So it is a great place and Abdullah, if you allow us, will bring more and more people in the coming few weeks. This is the greatest time and to talk about solutions, right? Dubai has been always about solutions. A lot of people look at crisis and challenges and recession, but we've been raised up in this country with a mentality of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid that we don't believe in crisis, we believe in challenges. And we always take challenges as opportunities to, to improve and go to the second level. Today I'm, give, I'm going to go through uh, my uh, presentation on real estate competitiveness. This is a result of two things, being in the real estate industry with land department and RIA for the last 13, 14 years, but also in the last five years I've taken the doctorate of business administration track and it was mainly on rethinking real estate competitiveness of Dubai. So this is even from before we started to see the slowdown recently. So I just want to make one disclaimer or two, one or two. Whatever I say today, because I want to be as free as I can and as honest as I should be, so I'm not going to represent Dubai government today. So, so if you want to quote me, quote me as Mahmoud, okay? Just to make things easier for you and me. And the second thing is that if there is anything that's related to the government, I will say this is the government. But most of the things I will say, I will say this is my personal opinions and views. So let's start. We are still affordable market. So if you look at this figure, how much $1 million can buy you? in so many cities, starting from Monaco, we find that Dubai is in the bottom, which means that we are an affordable city by all means compared to international markets, and this is a selling point, right? We talked about risk, and this is always should be brought into equation, how we think about risk. If you look at the World Economic Forum report of risks of 2019, you will find a list of top 10 risk in terms of likelihood and in terms of impact. And most of these risks actually are related to environmental risk, related to cyber attacks, related to uh, water crisis. And the last one, if you see in this list, is asset bubbles in major economy. So asset bubble, real estate is one of them. This is something that we have to deal with in 2019. It's a risk, and we always have to take that into account. I met this guy, I'm not sure if you know him. Who knows? This guy? Good. Who's he? Uh, from Singapore. Yes. He is the founder actually of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. So I met Lee Kuan Yew 2007. And I asked him a question. I still remember this question. This guy actually, who's the, who's, who was the guy? He was the guy who brought Singapore to what Singapore is today. Singapore is very similar to Dubai. It's a model that is similar to Dubai in so many aspects. It's the state city, it is uh, managed by a good leadership, and also it doesn't have resources, same as Dubai. So he said, I told him, what do you think about Dubai? And he said, um, um, I, li I like Dubai, and I like the way that Dubai is going. I'm only worried about the sustainability of what you have. This is what he said. And he triggered, triggered actually my interest to do my PhD and DBA on how to rethink Dubai competitiveness. I went to Twitter and I want to share with you how much we care about social media and what people think of Dubai. And this is something good for us as a real estate industry. Go to Twitter and any social media and write Dubai, real estate, real estate in Dubai. And I want you to look at how people view it. I mean, people have been viewing it till recently as a good, a positive, but in the last few weeks and last few months, we started to see people complaining. People are complaining about so many issues, right? So I am one of the guys who every day I don't sleep before going into Twitter and search Dubai, what people say about Dubai. 
what people say about our real estate market, what people say about RIRA, what people say about land department. And I make sure I read them in Arabic and English. And I take a list before I sleep, and the second day, I go and see people that I need to talk to. So this guy said, we've lost our life savings. So for them, real estate is not a transaction. You get a title deed. It's life saving. It's family. It's friends, right? So this is an emotional message that got into the heart of me and also the people I showed them this. And this lady, she went to Mecca to pray for God that she gets her money back from one of the developers. So I'm just telling you guys how much the industry that you are in is very important for us and it's also important for people. We want to be the happiest city on earth. Part of it and actually at the center of it is to make people happy. So we want to make sure that the real estate investment journey, journey and process is interesting, is enjoyable, is not something that they regret doing. So, of course, I had so many other stuff, but I cannot show. These are the two <laughs> nice stuff I wanted to share with you. But also, you can also Google and you can share on Twitter, put your company name and see what people talk about you. Maybe you get some interesting stuff. How true, how, I mean, they, it tells you at least something. It's not always true, but at least it tells you something. Crisis, any Chinese here? I was, yes. Oh, please say I'm correct here. Um, A crisis in Chinese has two symbols. Dangerous, one danger and one opportunity. Chance. Yes, opportunity. Chance, exactly. So guys, let's take this recession, slow down, challenge as opportunity. Are you taking this challenge with me? This is the beauty of life. We go through challenges, we become stronger, and there's so much research that have proved that when we go through challenges and risk and crisis, we become stronger. Our, in, it becomes part of our DNA. We become what Nassim Talib said, anti-fragile. And anti-fragile as a concept means what? Means it's not going back to your, I mean, it's not responding to a crisis and go back to original status. No, it means you benefit from crisis. You become stronger. And this is what we learn in Dubai. We always become stronger. 2007 and 8, we had a recession. We came much, much stronger than before. And this is a slowdown. We have to take it. This is how Dubai used to be, right? 1973. Who was here at that time? <laughs> no one. Good. I wasn't born, so anyways. This is how it used to be. Who sold real estate in this part of Dubai? <laughs> I just want, I'm giving you these pictures because I want you to relate to what you see nowadays. And books wasn't here as well. Right? <laughs> Abdullah? This is Dubai airport in 1960s. This guy used to come every day from 7 a.m. till 2 p.m. Then he closes the airport and he goes home. This is Dubai airport at that time. And this is it now. So we should be proud of the city that we belong to, right? <laughs> Thank you. I'm not here to give you positive messages, but I want to take you with me onto this journey. We belong to this city, we love this city, and we will continue in this city, and we will do whatever it takes to make Dubai always shine, because this is our future, our friends, our, our families are living here. We want to make sure that this experience, especially real estate, is sustainable. Okay, so this is how, and these pictures are taken from NASA. 1990, the red dot shows the urbanization, the housing, the projects in Dubai. This is actually Sheikh Zayed Road in 1990, not too long, 1990. See? These buildings are still there, right? You see them? This is Sheikh Zayed Road. So when we talk about leadership, these the picture tell us too much about them. 2002, this is the NASA, again, picture showing that so much progress spreading all over Dubai. 2006, 2008, 2010, and this is from land department. So I'm saying this is from government sources. From 1963 till 2008, I'm sharing with you the level of and the value of transactions. Less than half a billion from 1963 till 2000. Less than half a billion. But when we opened our economy, when we freed the market, when we came up with regulation, 
This is how the market reacted. We attracted so much people who trusted the system and leadership and the vision from zero to almost, from almost zero to 70, 80 billion dirhams of transaction per year. Recently, we used to see challenge, right, in Instagram, and everyone shows his picture 10 years ago and now. So I want you to look at the city itself as Dubai and look at challenge, how we used to be and how we became. So, and this is the beauty of being in Dubai. And this is the beauty of, if you want to look at yourself, look at the past, look at now, how much improvement took place in the last few years. So this is how we used to be. 1980, 2012, 2006, 2013, Burj Khalifa. So just imagine how much progress has happened in the last 20, 30 years in Dubai. And if we want to reflect into the future, we should be hopeful and we should be also confident that this country and this city will continue to grow. In land department data, we have an evidence of 217 nationalities of investors who invested in this market. If you go to the United Nations website, there are 193 only countries in their system. So we have more people trusted our system than do exist in the UN system. The, the, the message that maybe some people say, well, the opportunities and the market and speculators, yes, there was a percentage of that, but we shouldn't say it's all about speculation, it's all about opportunities. Now Dubai is offering people a great lifestyle, a living experience that they don't find in their own countries, uh, safety, security, all good things that we don't see in other places, right? I want you to leave today with one thing. Look at real estate not as buildings. Look at real estate as system. Look at the real estate as building a city, not selling and making percentages or commission. We are building, especially the developers here, and I have a great uh, person here today. I will ask him a question later. Who's, and this is a concept that we see, new concepts coming to the market and development, that makes me very proud that we are building a city. We're not just building buildings. This is a real estate system, and this is from academia, but it's good to look at. We look in the academia at real estate as a system with a space market here, which is the rental market, and here is the asset market, valuation market, and here is the construction, and here is the stock market or the stock adjustment. So, Space market, the rental, definitely impacts the sales market, which impacts the construction market. We add more, and this add to the stock, and so on. If there is a shock to the right or to the left, this will definitely reflect into a shock here, and also oversupply, and then this will add more and more. So look at it as a system. But how we rebalance the system, how we make the system sustainable, this is the journey, this is the conversation that I wanted to talk to you today about. This is an article that I've written a few months ago. It's how we rethink Dubai, Dubai 2.0, 10 ways to prepare for the future. I don't know, I don't wanna take so much time in each one of them, but I just wanna say that we need to look at long-term solutions when we deal with investors, when we deal with different stakeholders. 10 years visa, five years visa is a great news, right? Quality is important. And from my research, and about 70 people I met in this research, a lot of people complained about quality. But we see quality improving. So we want developers to build for long term. We want investors to come here for long term. We want to see Dubai and UAE working more on talent's attraction. We want to attract talented people. But to attract talented people, we want to give them affordable solutions, right? So, I'm very happy that we see cool living uh, projects going here and there. So Hive Developer is here. Uh, Lamar Capital is doing something on that. We're building now buildings specialized for young talents. They will pay a monthly rental, right? They will pay 10 to 20% less than the market. So we want to attract them. We want them to pay less. We want them to get a space to become innovative. We want the cost of failure to be minimum. We want people to try and fail and try again and fail and try again and succeed. 
50% of Fortune 500 in the US owners actually are immigrants, right? They're not Americans. So we want people who come here also to be a source of pride for us, a pride for us, coming up with innovative ideas, bringing a new economy, bringing new business ideas, employing more people, make this economy be an innovation-led, a knowledge-led economy. Quality of life, by quality of life, I mean social, economic, and environmental quality of life. And I will talk about this in details. Uh, urban planning, we need our urban planning to be more thought about. How we link the different jurisdictions, the different systems here, the master developers, the Dubai municipality, how we think of affordability to be at the center of urban planning system here in Dubai. We need to think of transparency and governance. We need better data sharing. We need people to know about every single thing happening. What is the performance of the market? The supply, the demand, the prices, the rents, the vacancy rates. And I was telling a couple of friends here today, I was in Singapore a few years ago to meet with institutional investors. I told them, why you guys, we don't see a lot of institutional investors here in Dubai. They told me, can you give us now exactly what is the vacancy rate in residential how much is supply coming in the coming few years? Can you tell us the rentals in Burj Khalifa area, for example? So said, they said, we don't come if we don't have enough data and information. So it's time to become more transparent, share the data with the market, and let the market actually use it. I'm very happy today we have some prop tech companies that we want these data to act on, solve the problems of the market. Government alone cannot solve the problems. And this is why we partner always with the private sector to solve the problems. Investor protection, we need innovative products for financing projects. We need to continue to be easy to do business. We need to think and rethink about cost of doing business. Cost of living, I'm not saying affordable housing is a solution to living. We, when we talk about affordable living, we talk about affordable housing, affordable retail, affordable uh, retail, affordable education, affordable health, so it's, 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 it's a system. And then social sustainability. I've looked at a couple of long-term solutions. Recently, Turkey has introduced the citizenship, so I'm not sure if you're aware of it. But there are a lot of competitors nowadays that we need to be aware of what they're doing. So $250,000 and you get the Turkish passport. $2 million or 2 million euro, you get Cyprus, which is the European Union. And I saw actually a lot of real estate brokers and agents now, they kind of forget about real estate a little bit and they're selling uh, citizenship programs, right? So when we talk about long term, I'm not here talking about citizenship, but we're talking about long term residencies, we're talking about more of long term solutions to people. And also we keep an eye on our competitors. How we rethink cities? We need to rethink the way we develop our city because of crisis, because of challenges, because of complexity. People's trust is going down. We need to deal with that, right? And that's why we need a multi-stakeholders approach to the market issues. We need to add the following pillars to how we think about our cities. The first pillar is sustainability with economic and social and environmental. We need to think of a stakeholder's voice. We need to think about resilience and system thinking. Let me tell you a little bit about each one. Sustainability, you know it, right? As I said, social, economic, and environmental sustainability. And it's important to enhance the competitiveness of the market. It has been proven that sustainability makes the market more competitive. And that's why we cannot grow just focusing on economic sustainability. We need to take the social, we need to take the environmental into account. Resilience, this is a very important concept that is coming more important, especially at this time when we talk about crisis and recessions and slowdown and so on. Interdependence of systems creates complexity. As you see, the systems now are becoming more and more interdependent. And this actually push systems into what we call them the fragility trap and as we regulate different parts of the market over time and we over regulate our system becomes less and less resilient over time and with that 
As part of the research of real estate competitiveness, the government and the private sector need to build adaptability, continuous learning in their DNA. And this is maybe something we discussed, Shaib, last time, right? On we need to know how to deal with recessions, crisis. This is an art and a science, right? Adapting to different situation. How we make recessions and crisis opportunities. System thinking, this is also a new concept that we should also know about. We cannot say real estate market is doing well without looking at hospitality, at tourism, at finance. This is different system. We need to have system leaders who think beyond the system that they are managing. So as we are facing a lot of challenges, we need this system thinking because the performance of the whole system matters more. It's not how good I'm doing in this system or subsystem. It's the overall system that I should care about and I should manage. So if we look at the real estate industry, how is the tourism feeding into the real estate system? How is the hospitality? How is the finance system helping or not helping the real estate? So and that's, this is the system thinking. We cannot keep thinking in linear direction. We need to keep uh, uh, thinking in uh, system thinking. I have a new types of leadership in this regard. This is the model that I developed from my PhD study on what makes a competitive real estate market. It's very simple and a lot of actually sub indices be, go under each one of them. But just to make it easy for you, the three pillars we need to care about. Quality of life, government and resilience, affordability. These are the three pillars of competitive real estate market. How does it apply to you as a real estate developer, as a real estate agent? We will talk about it. Quality of life as a concept means what? Economic growth, social sustainability, environmental sustainability, healthy cities, sustainable cities, smart cities. Government and resilience. From all research that we've been doing, people overemphasize on the role of government to make the market competitive. And this is why we're lucky in Dubai to have a visionary leadership that is building the city based on a vision. And we're very also uh, lucky in this city to have a government that has hands-on when it comes to real estate. Resilience as well, we've talked about it. It's important as we go ahead to keep this market growing, but at a sustainable rate. And if you compare today to 2008, and I will show you another figure, we see a soft landing compared to 2008. So this means we learned the lesson and we are becoming more adaptable. And the last pillar is affordability and we talked about affordable living. And by that we mean affordable housing, affordable education, affordable health, affordable retail, affordable living for people. What are the aspirations? What we want to achieve from this system? We want economic sustainability or economic impact. We need social sustainability. We need environmental sustainability. We need happiness. And this is the whole idea of what His Highness Sheikh Hamad also talked about. We need to create happy city here. What are the tools we use? Stakeholders, system leadership, governance, transparency, and technology. So technology, we should look at technology as enabler how we can use technology to achieve what we want to achieve, how we can use technology to become a happier city, more inclusive city, more sustainable city. This is the whole idea of this model. A city is what it is because our citizens are, are what they are. This is what Plato said. So we're building a city for people. We should ask them, and this is a question, I remember meeting the Prime Minister of Canada about two years ago in one of the events in the United Nations. And he was telling everyone that before he became the Prime Minister, he went to every single village and city in Canada. And he met with people. And he asked them, what do you want to see in your city? What is it that you don't like? What is it that you like? So, um, and this is how he based his elections program and this is how he won. But if we take it at the real estate developer's level, 
I'm not sure how many of you meet with people, see what they want, what kind of living they want, what kind of social amenities they want to see in their communities. This is important exercise. As we are becoming more mature market, we need to listen to the voice of investors and end users and make our communities customized to their needs, their wants. Now we're talking about a different stage of the real estate development uh, in Dubai. So what Shakespeare said, what is a city but the people? So at the end of the day, successful companies are the companies that look at people, what they want, and they give them the best service. From research findings, I don't know if you still have time. How much time I have? Enjoy? Plus, good. I'll share with you the major findings from my research. People look beyond buildings to the total offerings of the neighborhood and city. So we are not selling people unit in a building. No, we're selling them a community. We're selling them a city. And that's what, this is very important also when you sell as a broker, when you develop as a developer. Think of what community you want people to live in. Because now we're targeting end users. We're becoming more mature. So this question becoming more important. The quality of life, the social amenities that we provide in our cities. Government is more important and it will continue to be more important in driving this real estate market. Peace and security. We are on the top of list when it comes to peace and security and this is a selling point. Peace and security, you don't find them in so many places. And in real estate, especially, peace and security are important because real estate is a long term and people will not invest long term if they're not sure that the place they're investing in is peaceful and uh, secure. And leadership, so we're very lucky to have visionary leadership who always think ahead of time and we always have visionary leadership who think of the future. Resilience, we talked about it, affordable. Affordable housing brings stability, but it also brings economic diversity and improve the physical quality of neighborhood. So we need to have more, sorry, more and more of affordable housing. And we're very happy actually now to see communities based on affordable housing. And we have Shaib from Dubai South, right? And I've been following a lot with Dubai South and the news that they want to build affordable uh, master plan where people can uh, have affordable housing, affordable education, and a lot of other stuff. How we should regulate real estate market, how we plan better cities, there's two articles that I've written and I can share with you. We now need to move to a long-term model, right? So most of the stuff we have now is short-term competitiveness. So we're focusing too much on ease of doing business. We're focusing on short-term driven investors or speculators. And we're investing, we're focusing too much on, on investors. What we need now to switch the model to, we need a secure transactions. We need more focus on economic social environment. We need to attract the long-term driven stakeholders. We need to be more of end user centric. So this is the more sustainable form. This is the model that we need to switch to. And this is based on research. This is based on meeting 70 people from investors, consultants, policy makers, developers, all kinds of stakeholders. This is the model we need all to work towards. This is the most competitive, sustainable, and the way forward for our real estate market. So this is the, it's taken from one of the reports, I think you've seen it from John's Lang LaSalle's report. If you see the stage that we are in now, they call it soft landing. So I like the concept of soft landing. And this is the, the role of regulator, how we make sure that we grow, but when we go down, we do it in a soft way. And this is very evident in today's slowdown. The prices are going down, but in a more soft manner, in a more sustainable uh, manner. What we, we've been talking actually, that it's not an issue of cash. The market has so much cash. It's an issue that people want to listen to positive news. People want to see innovative product. People want to see more focus on community. They want to see more focus on other stuff like education and health and other stuff. Good news is that we have rates are coming, 
right? Real estate investment trust, and we see many REITs actually now being under formation, which is good news is that small investor who cannot afford to buy 1 million dirhams property, they can invest 20,000 dirhams in a REIT or in a fund. So now we have new vehicles for people to invest in real estate without even being subject to the management of real estate. And also it's less risky, right? You can sell it anytime, it's more liquid. So we're happy that REIT, and even there is a law that's being now drafted and hopefully it comes out. Now in DIFC we have it, but in the main Dubai land we will have it as well. Technology is disturbing the way that we're doing our real estate market. It may replace a lot of us as the brokers, right? I'm not a broker, by the way. <laughs> so there is a, a, an application called Purple Prex. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, from the UK. Uh, and this is now, I think, worth 93.7 million pound. Initially, Abdullah, correct me if I'm wrong. Initially, they thought that they can do it without brokers and maybe they had some success, but now they came to the fact that they cannot succeed without brokers. So they're bringing brokers back into the uh, picture. And al also there is a, an application called Open Door in the US doing something similar. But anyways, we have to be embracing technology rather than being afraid from technology as real estate agents and as real estate technology. Have you seen this news? Earn passive income by letting out your UAE home and Airbnb. We have about 10,000 units in the United Arab and Dubai that is listed on Airbnb, right? So Airbnb is also going to change the way we do real estate and short-term rentals and so on. We need to be aware of. Holidays, homes, concepts is coming into the picture, right? A lot of actual investors now find it more interesting and more rewarding to have their homes listed on holidays home rather than renting them at very uh, low prices now. Because our system, the rental system here in Dubai, once a, a tenant is stuck with you, he may continue forever, right? You have to be innovative. I don't want to tell you how to be innovative. <laughs> there are tricks to get tenants out, but I don't want to tell you. I'm sure you know most of them. Strong dollar, we need to care about the strong dollar. How is the strong US dollar? Because this means the strong dirhams affecting us. You know that the Chinese currency went down by 10% compared to the US dollar. But we still, mashallah, Abdullah, you're getting a lot of Chinese investors. You have to tell us the trick. <laughs> the Russian currency is going down by 14.75%. And this is compared to the dirhams to the dollar. And the Pakistani and the Indian. I've chosen these currencies because these are the traditional investors, right? So we cannot say that why people are not coming, why we don't see so many Russians as we used to see. This is also part of it. And this is part of system thinking that I want you to think about is that think of what's the impact of interest rate into real estate. What is the impact of currency? What is the impact of competition from other cities? We see a lot of affordability. We're so happy and glad to see developers now jumping in, giving people innovative financing, flexible financing. I'm not sure how risky that for them. And recently we've been talking, Shaib, about uh, rent to own, right? So this is a product that hopefully we see now in Dubai more official, inshallah. And this will give people a lot of uh, affordable options. 70% of people living in Dubai, residents, they don't own their homes, they're tenants. So making them owners this is a big opportunity for our real estate market but how we make them so we need to give them solutions right we need to give them affordable solutions if you lose your job don't worry you're not stuck with the property right we see a lot of i'm not doing for Amar. this is the picture i've taken but anyways <laughs> a lot of uh, developers are doing it uh, we need to see first home buyers programs and this is something that the government definitely is working on we also need to think of the service charge. This is part of affordability. What can I say? One of the communities in Dubai that a lot of you know, the service charge used to be seven dirhams per square foot. All of a sudden, it's 14. 
it's affordable community, but it's not affordable anymore if I end up paying 14 and 15 and 100% increase on the service charge. So when we talk about affordability, we talk about the life cycle affordability, not only in the time when I purchase the property, but also the maintenance, how much I pay. So when you sell to your people, tell them how much you will save. The service charge in this building is 10, but in that building is 20. You may get a property 100,000 less now, but what you will pay over the life cycle is much more. So we need the, new, the investors to think smart. Quality investors, now we see a lot of long-term end users. Now we see people that never thought about investing in Dubai, now that, oh, this is the best time. So let's take the drop in prices as a good opportunity. Why it's a bad news? It's a good news. This is the best news that we can have. People who couldn't buy before, this is the time, right? Sustainability is coming, cool living concepts are coming. I'm so happy that a couple of developers are thinking about cool living options, affordable op options. Sustainability, we should not forget that we as UAE residents, we have the biggest ecological footprint. Actually, they say if, we use, if the world uses the resources in the same way that UAE residents are using it, we need six times of the world resources. Okay, so how we become more sustainable is also important. Recently, we were part of uh, a toolkit that has been done by the Minister of Happiness, how to design happy communities, and I will be happy to share it with you. So now we see government direction into communities, starting with Sheikh Zayed's housing program, but this is going to be implemented at the whole UAE level. How we make sure when we design property, when we design communities, we make sure they are sustainable, they are socially sustainable, there are places for people, there's a mix of retail, residential, offices and stuff like that. And these are the criteria. Connectivity, infrastructure, location, culture and so on. We need to see our city more walkable and thanks to RTA, we see a lot of biking tracks have been added to the city. Today we have 316 kilometers of biking lines and this is going to be 850 kilometers by 2030. So good job. And why is that? I will tell you why. This is my two kids. <laughs> my daughter Diala was telling, I was reading a book called Happy City Book and she was like, Daddy, why you read this book? You don't need to read it. It's easy. Happy city is, ha is happy people. You don't need to read the book. And this is actually how we should think about building cities. We need to build cities and communities for kids. How many communities we're living in are friendly for kids? Do you feel safe sending your kids walking in the streets? This is how it used to be, 2016. This is my challenge. 2017. But I don't know, 2019, I gained a little bit more. And I'll tell you the secret. Every day before Maghrib, I go here in my community, Barsha South, and I walk for one hour. Although it's not very safe, you see this guy, he always parks here, so I have to cross from his behind. So it's not safe. But recently, actually, a month ago, I had one of the street's dogs chasing me and running me out all the way. So I said, forget about sports. I will stay at home. <laughs> so that's why I gained a little bit more weight. What makes happy cities? We have to have happy streets. If you go to the happiness indices, they always talk about Scandinavians are the happiest communities. But recently I was in a trip there and I've seen their streets. Most of them are empty. So I said, well, happy cities should be a livable city, a lively city. On my way back home, I took this book from the airport, from Copenhagen, and it says, the almost nearly perfect people. And he talks about, he's also from Denmark, but he says, um, um, I don't think we are the happiest people on earth. And he questions that. But then he goes into the history and context of happiness. And he says, well, he found that the reason. The reason is that Denmark long time ago used to be a kingdom that has Sweden and Norway and other places. But over time, they lost one by one. So they became more, you know, satisfied. Let's keep what we have. And this is what also the message that we have to get. What we're having is great. We always have to lower our expectations to enjoy life, right? 
So happiness has to do with the context, with the history. Cities should be kids friendly. And this guy is a great guy, and I think you should read for him, read his book and read his thoughts. He's the mayor of Bogota. And actually, he's the guy who started the happy city notion. He says that children are indicator species. If they're present, then you have a livable, safe, and happy city. So if you go and see a community full of kids, this is a great community. What people say about happy city? This is in India. I use Twitter a lot. I go and happy city and stuff. So I see what people say about them. So this guy say, how do you want to create happy city if it's not safe for kids? Happy city should be a social city, should be a green city. I wanted to share with you also Ikonawa from in Japan. Those guys have very interesting story. They were one of the most effective in the Second World War. But you know what? Now they have the longest living, they are the longest living citizens in the world. The minimum age is 83. And it's actually the only province in Japan that does not have trains or public transportation. So those guys walk more, socialize more. And if you go into the city or the province, you will see this on their, uh, one of the walls there. At 80, I am still a child. When I come to see you at 90, send me away to wait until I am 100. The older, the stronger. Let us not depend too much on our children as we age. If you seek long life and health, you are welcome in our village, where you will be blessed by nature. And together we will discover the secret of longevity. What does this have to do with real estate? This is the concept that I started with. We are building communities. We are building cities. We want to build healthy, smart communities. We want people to enjoy life. And this is what Dubai is all about. The happiness agenda of Sheikh Mohammed. Copenhagen is a case. Nine of, out of 10 people own a bike. How many ones here own a bike? Good, not bad. And those guys, they, they do 1.6 kilometer a day of biking. How many kilometers you do a day? A year? <laughs> and they also, actually biking in Copenhagen is 25% of the trips. You may say the weather here does not help and so on. Yes, this is another conversation. It's when the prime minister of Denmark met the prime minister or the president of uh, France. This is how they met over bicycle. So it's usually uh, cities that are adopting biking and walkability. They government leaders usually they are the first one to use them. So. A lot of government ministers, they go to work biking or walking, and they create this culture of, uh, like when you see Sheikh Mohammed using the metro, right? Oslo is the green capital of Europe, 2019. They have something called climate budget, a budget just for the climate and to deal with the climate change. And 30% of the new cars sold in Oslo were electric cars. So here I'm selling you guys the environment side. I know maybe it's not interesting for so many of you, but if we are building a city for the future, this is health, this is environment. I will tell you why. Forget. You know that you, we are alcoholics here in the UAE, and we are the sixth highest global user of social media, and with social media, we start comparing ourselves to others and we become less happy. This guy, Dr. Oz, said that the UAE people are more stressed than the West. We sleep less. So guys, please take care of yourself. It's a slow down, but just take it easy. It's going to be over. I don't want to go into this. I can share it with you later. It's about the technology and how 85% of companies in real estate are using social media. So. You, in crisis time, it's leadership. We choose either the panic or the calm. And this is what I've been telling you. We need to be calm. Look at our priorities. Look at long term. It's in the time of crisis that good leaders emerge. So be one of them. Build trust. You may not aim or you shouldn't aim to be always perfect. 
but aim to be anti-fragile, where you can benefit from slowdown, from crisis, from recession. We need to be more transparent. We need to look at customer service. I hear so many people complaining about customer service from developers. This is a serious issue. They came, they bought from you, keep this great relationship, they come back to you. At least answer their phone or emails. I've received a lot of complaints. Clean the market, this is our job. It's time now to clean the market, get the bad guys out, keep the good ones. And this is something I want to finish with. We need the speed, but also we need the carriage. You know that the lion speed is 58 kilometer per hour. It's faster than the gazelle. But the only issue is that the gazelle keeps looking backward and slows down most of the time. And that's why the coward gazelle gets eaten by the lion. So you need the speed, but also you need to be brave, right? This is the age of speed and being brave. And this is something I found as well. Interesting. All birds find shelter during a rain, but eagles avoid that by flying above the clouds. So it's a matter of attitude, but I also say it's a matter of altitude, how high you fly. Different market, new stuff. This is what we want to see, the city that we are living in. A happy one, inclusive, affordable, sustainable, and smart. Thank you so much for listening. Maybe my question may come up as a little bit controversial, but the, the, the issue of transparency. You, men you mentioned why Singapore attracted a lot of institutional investors, uh, REITs, investment funds, uh, real estate, uh, uh, private equity firms uh, to invest in the city is, you know, uh, is, is mainly or, or largely due to, to, uh, uh, to, to transparency. Um, and I think there is an opportunity uh, in Dubai for Dubai. It's already investor friendly, it's already uh, uh, understandable as a market. Uh, uh, there's a huge opportunity here for, for uh, REITs. Uh, we've, we've seen also a movement recently from Saudi, a lot of the, the Saudi leads are moving into, into, into Dubai real estate. However, it, it always become, it's always been uh, uh, an issue with regards to, to, to figures, transparency, what's the actual supply coming up, where is the data, where can we find this data uh, you know, in order to actually analyze it. Um, we've seen more and more transparency recently. We see you know, uh, now you know, on my Twitter and on my LinkedIn, I see daily transactions, you know, uh, the land the department issues, how much transactions on a daily basis are happening. Uh, uh, however, we, we don't see data related to you know, what kind of vacancy there is in downtown. This is more uh, uh, driven by, let's say, research companies and, and uh, uh, analysts that, that come up with this data. Uh, what is the direction, uh, maybe from the, from the uh, land department side or from the era side, in terms of, of availing some of these resources or some of these, these, this, this information to, to the market in order to, to make it even more competitive than it is today? Great question, and I think definitely transparency is linked with maturity of market. It's also linked to the quality of investor. If we want to attract long-term investor, we need this market to be transparent. This is how we attract them. And Singapore, you mentioned, is a great example of how much transparency you find in the market. If you go to the URA, which is the Urban Redevelopment Authority, and the SLA, Singapore Land Authority of Singapore, you will be amazed by how organized the data on supply, demand, what's coming on pipeline, the prices, the rents, the vacancy. I would love to see this on our website. And today, I'm, now I'm speaking as Mahmoud, okay? And I will speak about DLD. But as Mahmoud, I would love to see this data because if we don't publish them, we have hundreds of consultants will come and publish confusing number. And I remember when I joined RIRA in 2008, every day I, I read a different report, EVG Herms, 50,000 units is coming to the market. Sorry, I mentioned this company name, I shouldn't. Another company says 30,000. A third company, 15,000, 10,000. So if we allow, if we don't give people the accurate data, someone else will do it. But they will do it in a confusing way. So we need to provide the data. Maybe what we need to do is to provide the minimum and then leave it to the private sector to analyze it, to make sense of it, to compare this year to last year, look at the profiles, 
of the investors. I think one of the issues, any video? I was the head of research 2008 when the crisis took place, if we can call it a crisis. We like to call it a challenge. And I remember that we had some internal discussions. Should we publish or not? And they were like, no, we shouldn't publish. People will see that the prices are going down. So I was one of the guys who said, prices are going down can be a good news because some people are waiting for prices to go down so they can buy. So if we become transparent and share with people everything, we expect people to actually not panic. Actually, most of the problems that we see in a lot of economies, even the 2007 and 8 crisis, it was a confidence, it was a sentiment crisis. So if people have enough data and information, they can take decision based on information. If I look at the prices today and it's 30% less than 2014, when I thought of buying, I will buy now. If I look at Imar or Nakhil or whoever is doing the flexible payment, three, four years ago and Dubai South they didn't use to give us such payment plans. Now you have more affordable options. Now the off-plan market, by the way, we thought that it's going to be dead in 2008 when we saw so many projects on hold and a lot of projects get, did not get completed. But last year or the year before, 70% of transactions were off plan. So this means what? People trust now the, the regulation, they trust the developers, the quality, they know the good or bad. So we need to work on our data. We need, and this is a responsibility of land department. And also we see now with the cooperation of master developers, we will see this reality soon. The other part of transparency is not only data, it's the enforcement. Enforcement of laws and regulation. And this is something that the government is working on. And they will have, hopefully soon, in the dispute center and land department, it will also deal with not only rental, it will also deal with the issues between investors and developers. It will make the, the, what we call it, the dispute resolution faster, smoother, and cheaper. So hopefully we see, we usually take slow down as an opportunity to look back at the system, what we've done right, what we've done wrong. It's always, I mean, we're not 100% perfect people. We do mistakes, but we correct them. And this is what we will see in the coming few weeks or few months. Thank you. One male, one female. <laughs> Can you elaborate more in the last part? Do you think that that law, which basically prevents from getting any solid statistical data out, would be somehow worked out? Uh, it's not a law, actually. For the protection of privacy? You mean the... So, for instance, title deeds, the ownership documents, and then... Ah, oh, you want them to be public now, data? Well, no, no, I didn't say I want them, but in other countries that's a matter yeah. of practice. Okay, I'll answer this question. I was part of the team who worked on the ease of doing business with the World Bank and part of it is property registration and part of property registration is the public records. So we have a different situation and we've been also discussing it with the World Bank officials as well. The whole idea of having public records is to make sure that we don't have fraud in the, in the system. So land department came up with a system and I'm sure you, some of you are using it. You can go, you, we don't tell you who owns this parcel of land, but we verify information for you. So you may say, is this property owned by Abdullah? Then the system says yes or no. 
but we will not give you that this land is owned. We get, this creates a lot of challenges, especially for a lot of uh, giving that we are in an Arab Muslim country. There's so much people don't want anyone or they don't want to share how much they own, right? Even when we started registering rental contracts, we had some big rich families here said, we don't want to share rental contracts with you because we don't want people to know how much we make on a yearly basis. So still the culture we're dealing with, but we are putting more tools to make sure that there is no fraud. So you can check with land department, you can make sure that you can verify the documents and you can verify the ownership. Question on off land. You just mentioned that it's, uh, you're, you're working on this uh, for the disputes, right? A lot of disputes are going on in the market. Uh, the evening chest tower, which is in under auction right now, probably very soon is coming. And uh, few of, two years back, I've sold a few properties uh, with seven tides that I don't like it either. So a few of my buyers are really disappointed because of the, the delay. It's supposed to be delay in what? Delay, delay in, in delivery. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, can I here? Yeah. so this the, this one is delayed like 18 months by seven times, and my client is running around to Rera and going to the developer, and they are not doing anything. So he's really frustrated. You know, we bought it in 2017, one of the good year and buying for off plan. You know, and he bought two more properties for me, and he wants to buy more, but he's really worried now what's going to happen in that project because he's living literally right next door. Mm. Uh, I was trying to bring him today but he's unfortunately busy with his family because he has some more questions. It's a good thing he didn't come. I said, because he really wanted to meet someone who can answer his questions or, or if he can cancel his podcast. Yes. Yes. I mean, cancelling a, a, a contract is something, I mean, we have a process for that. And if you as an investor wants to cancel a contract, you have to go through the court. But recently there are talks internally to make the laws more towards, I mean, favoring the investors. So hopefully soon we see changes when it comes to delays and we will, when it comes to compensation and when it comes to fines. I cannot give more details, but I think we will see more government direction towards investors. But you always can come and complain in RIRA and RIRA can pressure them, can ask them to reschedule the payments. We can work out solutions with them. It's not copy-paste solutions for each project is a different project. We want to make sure that the projects are delivered on time. Developers sometimes complain that investors are not paying on time, that's why we are late. So we want to make sure that at the end of the day, it's a win-win solution. We don't want developers to lose, we don't want investors to lose, we want, but as a Mahmoud now, I think we have a more responsibility to be in the side of investor nowadays. We have to be more investor centric than developers. And this is what we will see, hopefully. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Uh, for sure, um, you know, he invested more than 10 million in 2017 for me. And, you know, I'm looking for, for the 5 to 10 million maybe this year. But it depends upon if he gets some money back from his developer this year. Or <laughs> <laughs> Who's the developer, by the way? He's here? No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. It's the biggest developer. Okay, let's, let's exchange emails. Okay. I will see how we can help internally. Thank you. Thank you. Agents? Agents? Yeah. The good guys or the bad guys? The bad ones. Okay. I wrote an, uh, a co an, on LinkedIn about the brokers. Yeah. Do you think having a trust account for brokers is a good thing? And I, one of the CEOs of one of the companies, I'm not sure if he's here, said, why everything is blamed on the brokers? So, <laughs> so definitely there are a lot of measures going to be taken, not only with the brokers, but the whole system to make sure that ethical, legal, long-term people are in the system. We we'll always have people who will try to outsmart the system. We actually try to, and this is what we do in RIRA most of the time. We have 5,000 brokers, we have 500 real estate developers, we have so many hundreds of property management and so on, and the team is very small in RIRA. So we trust you more to tell us 
Whenever you see bad things going on in the market, tell us, report to us, write, email us, and we will take actions. And this is what we do. I go to Twitter just to find anyone complaining about anything. <laughs> and my wife looks out, what are you doing? To whom are you chatting? I said, no, I'm not chatting, I'm just <laughs> looking at <laughs> I can't sleep if I don't go there and see what people are complaining about. So help us finding the bad ones and, keep, and getting them out of the market. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mahmoud, uh, <coughs> My name is Bilal Mundi, and I'm the managing partner of uh, Benjamin's Valuations. Uh, I'm the greatest fan of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed's vision to Dubai Land Department, to the city of Dubai, and to Mahmoud and Burai as well for the support you always provide. Um, I also believe in the fact that there is no country like UAE that comes to living in ease of doing business, having lived in about eight to nine countries in the past. Um, and I also put on record a lot of initiatives that have been taken from across the real estate sectors to improve this, this sector over a long time. And I am very happy to hear that you are talking about more sustainability, more long-term investors coming in and make the residents here as happy as possible. Um, my one confusion, if I may use the word carefully, and, and, and I'm talking to Mr. Mahmoud and not the way I'm the Okay, good. The I'm also confused. <laughs> so one of my biggest confusion is, confusions is that at one hand, we are talking about a long-term investment. Sorry. Okay. Which usually runs into millions, from one million to 10 to 100. On the other hand, we look at the arrangements to stay here in the country in terms of visas is three years, two years. I'm very happy to see, and I'm, I'm going to finish in a second. I'm very, very happy to see the 10-year visas coming now for the professionals and five years coming up for the retirees. Why don't we think about, again, it's a suggestion, not a criticism, please. Shaib, you have to answer the question. He's the head of immigration. <laughs> so, so to, to make people, you know, getting into long-term businesses and investments in this country, why can't we think about, I'm using my word carefully, long, long, longer term visa arrangements for a certain level of investments and this is preferable to all, which makes this whole system a bit more sustainable than, than it is now, in my humble opinion. I think I've been enough careful about this, but I know what, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But, but long term for you is beyond 10? Why not? Okay, and, and tell you. Just because I want you to define long. It's my, it's my person deep analysis. Yeah. Talking to many investors, many business yeah. people over the last many, many years. Dubai is the most, the biggest beneficiary of doing so. Yes. If you do that, the UAE okay. will be the biggest beneficiary of that. Not only the residents, but also the UAE itself. We started about three years ago uh, what we call the skin in land department. The skin is a, anyone who invests over one million dirham, which is not too much, you can get a three years visa, residency. And this is happening three years ago and people are happy with it. Now they are fit because, you know, immigration at the end of the day and visas and residency, this is more of a federal issue discussed at federal level and implemented at different Emirates level. Now there are system for five years and 10 years. More capital is involved. So, f I mean, getting a three years residency with one million is something that people actually value. But I am also, I, I, re I, I really support what you're saying that we need longer term. Thank you, sir. And uh, hopefully, and I'm sure the government is listening, right? One question. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this is Lucy's question. Okay. Uh, a questions from the field. Now, uh, we have all those amazing post payment plans, which uh, means that no title deeds is given upon handover. So, how does the tenant who takes over a property on a post payment plan can register DIWA and you know get a jari and all this, considering that there is no title deed involved? There is a title deed actually, or there is something we call it 
uh, title deed restricted, restricted by the years of payments. I have bought one using this title deed. So there is a system, it's a newly implemented, and you can check with land department on that. But for flexible, for five and 10 years payments, and hopefully rent to own, there will be a title deed for that. It's called um, a deed restricted by number of, what does it say? Yes. No, this is a uh, code of plan. But I have one that says it's a deed restricted by the payments plan. So if you don't continue, there is one of the clauses. If you don't continue to pay, you lose whatever you paid. I think something like that. That was uh, Lucy's question to you because I, <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'm going to ask. Okay. Uh, in my experience, we got actually a jari on a court. Yes. It was a commercial property, so I guess exceptions are made, especially for recently yeah. developed properties. I have another question, though, <laughs> uh, again from Lucy, but I think our... Where is Lucy? <laughs> 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 Mm. This is done through Dubai Tourism Department. They have a system. So any owner, if you want to do short term, all you have to do is an easy process, Dubai Tourism Department. This is the only approval you need. So uh, I, I recommend that you talk to Dubai Tourism Department. I had actually a talk with them recently on the holidays homes and there are a couple of stuff going on, a fraud or a case going on with the holidays home. And they were very helpful. So there is a guidelines how you can have your home rented for short. There is a process of registration. They verify the title deed. They make sure you're the owner. They never ask for an OC from developer. So just do it through them. Uh, related to that, actually, yes. that's, that's a good question because we have a holiday homes uh, mm. uh, division, and we, you know, we, we, we've had situations in the past that, you know, uh, thankfully now they're not happening as much, but. When, when a developer sells a property to an investor, uh, in, in many cases the SPA states that you cannot do short term. It, it That's right, it states in the SPA. So they, you know, and specifically with large developers like Amar and Miras, mm. that's actually one of the clauses in the SPA. Now, when, when, you, know, when, when you go to, to Dubai Tourism and issue a license for the permit, they issue the, li the license for the permit. So it, 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 you know, they, they give you the license because you mm. already have a title deed on this property, you know, uh, they don't consider the SPA. They, from mm. a DTCM perspective, they don't consider the, the, the SPA as valid, you know, as, yeah. as far as they're concerned. As long as it's a residential property, it's not a hotel apartment, yeah. uh, then, you know, you, uh, there are no restrictions on that. Um, so we've seen movement from some of these developers that, you know, when, we, when, when, when you take a, a, an apartment on a holiday home basis, they start to, you know, uh, try to make it difficult, mm. you know, uh, mm. et cetera. But uh, most recently we've seen that becoming more easy Easier. and they're turning a blind eye so that mm. as if there is, there is no problem. Now, the question is what, what trumps the other? Is it the, you know, if you have a DTCM license for the, for the unit uh, and you're operating it, does that mean <coughs> as an owner I'm still, you know, in breach of my SPA, which I signed with the developer? How does that work from a DLD mm. perspective? Well, this is a good question and uh, let me try. I think that DTCM, there is a law on holidays home that was passed immediately after Dubai winning the expo. So we really wanted this short-term rental to, to flourish, but we want it to be regulated. So there is a law that says that Dubai tourism are the authority that decides on short-term. So I assume that DTCM has more power compared to the developer. But I also think we should also review the owners associations and what they have as guidelines and rules. If there's any internal rules that says stuff, I mean, let me come back on this because I want to, to get some internal advice. But as far as I know from the internal team discussion on holidays home, it's the Dubai tourism department that should regulate this, should license this, and they're doing this. Thank you. No Lucy question. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not from Lucy, right?
Okay. You were talking about regulating of service charges. And honestly, um, I've been in this country long enough, not always as a broker, not much as a broker, but I've noticed that service charges jumped from, I remember, 800 square feet to 23 now, in just the span of 10 years. And honestly, I believe that there is something unethical about it. I've been doing property management for half of the time that I've been in Dubai. And I can assess the expenses involved in to maintain facility managing a building. How do you how do you manage this? Because honestly, um, I've been trying to talk to one of the uh, for the F1 company for the building that I am, you know, I've purchased a unit. I'm not going to mention any names, but it's impossible to get them to reply to your mails. It's Who the owners? Uh, yeah. The management. No, the facility, not the owners' association. The management company. They even I mm. believe uh, a several the house per square feet for that particular property doesn't make sense. So um, uh, recently, Rira has also introduced the auditing uh, profession. So now all the service charge are audited. We make sure that they reflect the reality. The our meeting recently with the owners association management company, we've seen a lot of challenges they're facing. First of all, on collection. So the current collection is about 60%, 40% not collected. So uh, this is the average. So they have to go and they cannot cover all the surfaces of the building. So they first look at D1 in power and then they pay the rest of the bills and especially security and cleaning are getting less and less attention. So uh, now we're talking about mechanism, how to make collection better and faster. So you will not pay more. And also we're looking with D1 and Empower and reducing the energy costs and stuff. So we're expecting a 10 to 20% reduction on service charge uh, in the coming few months. Uh, I mean, this is what we've discussed in the same place here with the owners association management companies. We got a lot of solutions from them and we're going to work on them. The complaints about the management companies, you can complain to the board. And if you don't hear anything back, you complain to the owners association department in RERA. Uh, this is how it works. There is complaints at RERA with Gov.ae. Yes, because honestly, at the end of the year, we pay like 20% overhead about the service charges, which is not included in the expense, which is a lot. Yeah. And then comments from other people, like owners, is like, ah, rather just blindly sign, so whatever they receive, they don't check. It's, it's now in the top priority of the government and soon there will be a press release in the coming two, three days says that RERA urges on association management, government agencies, D1 in power to reduce their fees. So you will see this in the news. <laughs> Any other question? Not from Lucy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Abdullah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.